<laughs> okay, well, let's get started. Well, welcome. Uh, this is a community discussion on opioid use disorder. My name is Charlie Kimball. I'm the state representative from Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth. Uh, and this is meant to be a community discussion with an expert panel to address this topic. So the schedule for tonight uh, is really to have an introduction of the panel members and to then pose the question that led to this panel discussion and then give each panel member five, member, uh, five minutes, up to five minutes, and I'll try to be polite in cutting you off, um, and then uh, to discuss what could be an answer to a very complex question. And the second part is then for the moderator, that's me, to pose a series of questions to the panel members uh, and spend about 15, 20 minutes doing that and then open it up to the audience for questions for you to ask as well. So that's really the format. We hope to have it in a nice um, discourse, so that a civil discourse, this is a complex problem, and we'll get right into it. With that, uh, again, just for the record, it is September 20th in the closing days of summer here in Woodstock, Vermont, uh, at 7 p.m. So uh, with us today are three members uh, in the mental health community and in the health community in Vermont. Uh, I'll introduce them as they are seated at the table. Al Gobey is seated by far end. He is a secretary of the Vermont Agency of Human Services, the largest of the agencies in state government. Over 3,500 people work in AHS, roughly 44% of the 8,100 state employees. AHS includes a diverse group of departments, including corrections, health, children and families, mental health, health access and disabilities, aging and independent living. Secretary Gobey was appointed to the Green Mountain Care Board in 2011 by then Governor Peter Shumlin and two years later became chair. He was tasked with directing the board's charge of curbing health care cost growth and reforming the way health care is provided to Vermonters, which led to the state's current pilot project of an all-payer model through accountable care organizations. In the private sector, Secretary Gobey owns and operates Gobey Hospitality, a Burlington-based restaurant hospitality business that includes Shanty on the Shore and Burlington Bay Market and Cafe. Uh, they currently employ over 125 people, or 100 people. Sorry, I didn't mean to exaggerate. Um, Secretary Gobey served on the Town of Shelburne, Shelburne Select Board, was a um, board member of the Visiting Nurses Association, uh, and served on the State of Vermont's Payment Reform Advisory Committee. He's a graduate of Norwich University and has served as an officer in the United States Army. He will do push-ups if asked, I've understood, uh, but we don't want to do that. Only if directed by a superior officer. Sitting next to Al is uh, Jill Lord. Jill is the Director of Community Health for Mount Scudney Hospital and Health Center. Mount Scudney Hospital and Health Center is a critical access hospital in Windsor, Vermont. Founded in 1933, Mount Scudney Hospital and Health Center is a not-for-profit community hospital network, including the Mount Scudney Hospital in Windsor and also the Ottaquichi Health Center in Woodstock. Affiliated with Dartmouth-Hitchcock, the hospital provides people and communities across the Connecticut River Valley with primary care and a comprehensive suite of specialty services. Their mission statement is the most succinct mission statement I've ever read. It's to improve the lives of those we serve. She earned a master's degree in human services administration from New Hampshire College and received her Bachelor in Science and Nursing from the University of Vermont in Burlington. Go Cats! Ms. Lord was, has been a nurse for 40 years and was Chief Nursing Officer and Director of Patient Care Services for the hospital for nearly 25 years prior to her current position. You must have started when you were 10. <laughs> Additionally, uh, Ms. Lord leads, uh, leads the Ethics Committee, is past president and member of the Vermont Organization of Nurse Leaders, President of Windsor Area Community Partnership, Program Manager Blueprint for Health, and Chair of the Windsor HSA Community Collaborative. She is involved with the Windsor Area Drug Task Force, the Patch Network, and a myriad of other community health initiatives. The introductions could take most of the evening. <laughs> Sitting to my right is George Karabakakis, uh, and it is tough to say that well times fast. Thank you. Well done, uh, he is the CEO of Healthcare and Rehabilitative Services. HCRS is a member of the Vermont Care Network, a statewide provider of 16 nonprofit community based agencies that serve Vermonters affected by developmental disabilities, mental health conditions, and substance use disorders. HCRS serves the residents of Wyndham and Windsor counties. George has been with HCRS since 1994 
and has had several leadership positions in the organization, including Chief Operating Officer, Director of Adult Outpatient and Emergency Services, and Director of Outpatient and Children's Services for the organization. He has extensive experience as a clinician in a variety of settings. He obtained his PhD in clinical psychology from the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California, after completing his undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley. He has been a licensed clinical psychologist in New Hampshire and Massachusetts and maintains licensure in Vermont. He has served as a governor-appointed member of the Vermont State Standing Committee for Adult Mental Health and is a governor-appointed member of the statewide advisory group for Agency of Human Services Reorganization. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. It's a very uh, distinguished panel. I really appreciate you coming to here. The topic was actually brought um, by a constituent of mine, really, after reading a report from the Center, Centers for Disease Control that was recently released. And the, it, it did state in that, in August, that the results of a study about opioid use by pregnant women, using hospital data from 28 states collected from 1999 to 2014, the researchers determined the state-specific trends in opioid use disorder. Vermont had the highest prevalence, with 48.6 opioid use disorder cases per 1,000 delivery hospitalizations compared to the average of 6.5 per thousand. Yeah. So some of the questions we hope to address. Is the crisis truly that bad? Yeah. What is the medical community, social service agencies, and state government going to, uh, doing to address the epidemic? What is the root cause of the opioid epidemic, and what can we do to eradicate it? What is the cost of social services being extended to those with opioid use disorder? How does Vermont compare to other states in terms of effectiveness of its efforts to address the issue and the cost of doing so? What are the metrics used? So those are the questions we hope to address. There's no way we can answer them uh, finally uh, with any resolution tonight. This is topics that have been beguiling the uh, public service for years. So we're going in alphabetical order. Uh, so we'll start with Alco Bay. As you have five minutes to answer that question, Secretary. So I, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, having me here tonight. I think uh, at the 2020 presidential election, you should be the moderator. <laughs> you did a great job. I really appreciate it. Um, so my take on uh, sort of where we're at and what's going on with the opioid crisis is that um, it is certainly um, a really, really bad story. You know, so I can give you things that will sound like we're, we're improving or something good is being done or we're taking a lot of action, but I don't want to in any way sugarcoat the fact that this is a true crisis. You know, we have over 100 Vermonters that die every year now due to overdose, uh, due to an overdose death due to opioids. With fentanyl and carfentanyl entering the marketplace, um, I don't want to say this, but those numbers may even increase. And so this is tragic. This affects every family, every street, everyone in the state of Vermont. I don't know of anyone I've run into who says, I've never heard of this. So <clears throat> I could spend literally three hours describing to you how we got into this, what the problem is now, when in history we've had problems with heroin, where heroin came from, what the difference in an opiate and an opioid is, but you know that's all technical. The human cost of this is immense, mm -hmm. and I and I want to just say that the report that you cite, um, you know, is one of those situations where uh, when you measure things, one measure doesn't really tell a story. And so we show up as number one, and that's you know that made me say, oh my God, this is terrible. But then I started digging into it, and I met with the health department and said, what do these numbers mean? And there's more to the story, but I'm not trying to defend the story because I just said it's a tragedy. In Vermont, we do a very good job of getting pregnant women that are addicted to opioids into medically assisted treatment. With that, we then monitor them pre-birth. More of them go to term. More babies are born at a higher birth weight and more babies uh, are born not addicted to opioids. And so while we may have the highest level, it's because of the programs that we have and the recording of the situation. 
So in that measure, we look terrible until you know more, and then you can see all the effort that all the communities have put into it. Because Vermont is at the vanguard of medically assisted treatment in the United States. Under Governor Shumlin, a good friend of mine, and under Governor Scott, a good friend of mine, Democrat and Republican, we have built out a complete um, hub and spoke model that allows us to offer medically assisted treatment almost on demand, and I can, you know, I can explain the caveat, um, in our state. I will tell you that there's no other state that is even close to what we've been able to accomplish with the hub and spoke. But don't for a minute think that I think that solves the problem because it doesn't prevent people from getting addicted. It doesn't stop the fact that people are addicted and it doesn't change the brain chemistry in everyone that has been uh, basically exposed to these medications and that is addicted. And so we need to do a full court press in four areas. The first is prevention. Prevention is wide and we often don't invest in it because we don't see the returns for years. And state budgets don't like that. But prevention is really important in this. We have to prevent people from becoming addicted. A lot of that has to do with prescribing patterns of doctors. This has been a pill problem. Meaning, a pill was created that got people addicted. Doctors were told that pain was the next vital sign they had to worry about. And if you've read the book, if you haven't read the book Dreamland, your homework assignment tonight is read the book Dreamland. Yeah. When you're done with that, read The Realm of the Hungry Ghost. And when you're done with that, read a book that's fun. Because you're gonna need to read a fun book because they are tough. But so with prevention, um, you know, the question is, can we not get people addicted due to pills? Can we prevent this from happening? Can we prevent all of the bad things? Senator, how are you? Can we prevent all of the bad things from happening? Um, you know, basically do prevention in schools, do prevention in communities, et cetera. The second leg of this four-legged stool is treatment, medically assisted treatment and other treatments. The third is recovery. And that is an area in our state where I think we need a lot of work. I can talk about it more if there's time, but I don't want to get, I don't want to get um, stuck on something. Last is enforcement, because this, there is a law enforcement component to this. Because, you know, drugs are being brought into the state, and, you know, we, we don't want to um, send people that are addicted to jail for use of opioids. Okay, I want to be clear about that. But we don't want people driving carloads of fentanyl-laced heroin into our state either. And so those are the four stool, legs of the stool. That's what we've been working on. We spend millions on this. Just in the hub and spoke, I think it's about 18 million. Total substance use expenditure in the state is about 75 million. That includes alcohol, tobacco, some, you know, and some other things. But th these are big programs and big money. But none of that money even equates to anywhere near what we spend in corrections or in the Department of Mental Health, caring for people that are either incarcerated because of behaviors around this or people that suffer from mental illness and their families suffer through that that are impacted by this as well. And so if you, if you want to take a few key things away from me, um, it would be number one, this is a crisis. It has not gone away. We are not resting. We are not thinking things are better. We actually think with fentanyl and carfentanyl, the human toll could get worse. The second thing, we're working really hard on it. We're not being, we're not being misers of money or, or, or anything of the like. We're trying to address the issue as best we can as a chronic illness, meaning addiction is a chronic illness. It needs to be treated as such. That's really hard for people to sort of understand. Um, I gave a speech with the, um, basically the drug czar in Burlington, and I talked about, you know, there's a great song by Neil Young entitled The Needle and the Damage Done. Yeah. And you listen to that, and it's a he's a beautiful man, he sings beautiful music, it's a beautiful song until you listen to the words. But what we thought about uh, drug addiction back then, and the way that we stigmatized it and the way we treated it, is not what we know now. This is a chronic illness. Whether you're serving time in corrections, whether you're living in Burlington or Brattleboro, you should be able to get treatment for this. And we have to work together on it because, and I'm sure you're gonna talk about this, we need doctors to cooperate because hubs which produce treatment with methadone and suboxone and also the, the social work that goes along with it and psychology that goes along with it, 
are one part of the hub and spoke. The spoke is primary care docs or nurse practitioners prescribing Suboxone to people so they don't have to go to the hub anymore because they can get a prescription for more than one day. So it takes a village, <laughs> it takes a state, and I'm going to stop there. Your timing is good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Secretary. So our next, uh, again, in the order of alphabet, is George Karabakakis. Uh, so, George? Okay. <clears throat> well, needless to say, as I think, you know, you very eloquently and articulately put out there, it is a crisis. And, uh, and yet it is very complicated. It's a public health issue. There's no question that the data is there. It supports that. I mean, we are, we're the sixth highest, uh, we have the sixth highest prevalence of past year heroin use in the country. Uh, the, uh, the impact, one of the things that I, that I think really, uh, I think is really critical is that it also impacts families and kids that about over 50% of the kids from zero to five who are in custody in the state of Vermont are, uh, are there because due to opiate abuse. It is, it is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And that impacts families, that impacts our system, that impacts the kids, that becomes an intergenerational issue that I think is a real challenge. And I think, you know, Al, you mentioned the human cost. I mean, that is so at the heart of everything that we do that that it, it, there's genetics, there's biology, there's certainly the psychological pieces. This is a public health issue. This is an illness. This is a chronic disease. This is something that needs to be addressed in multiple ways, but we also can't remember the fact that one of the key issues is connection. It's connection in the community. The fact that oftentimes, and a lot of people that I've talked to, who have been in recovery, and I think it's really important to include and involve people who are in recovery, who have been in recovery, who are family members. It's absolutely critical uh, because they, I hear over and over again that the hope is lost. It's, there's all the social factors that influence health care, that drive a lot of our concerns, uh, the, the, whether it's housing, whether it's employment, whether it's uh, just Feeling connected to the community, those are things that are really critical. And I, I, I do believe that those there, as well as poverty, I think those are things that in many ways are root causes and I think impact uh, this issue, this, this problem that we have, this crisis that we're in. Uh, and. Uh, I think as a, certainly as a community mental health system, those are many of the things that we're, we're working on through case management and you know, all, all the services that we offer. Um, I, and I, I, I know it's my part. At some point, I'd love to hear from Kay Lamphere, our adult director, because there's some programs that I think are really remarkable because uh, it's not just the things that I just mentioned, but it, I think it's us working as a community because the answer is not in any one person, it's not in any one organization, <coughs> but it's as communities coming together as coalitions to really address the issues because that is where the connection happens. Oftentimes it doesn't happen with a paid person. It doesn't happen with a set of services that may come and go. I mean, earlier we were talking about sustainability. We may be able to fund a program or an individual, and then two years, three years down the line, that funding isn't there. It's not available. And so it's really our communities coming together and understanding that this is a community issue, this is a community problem, and the answers lie in those collaborations, in those coalitions. And I think we have a lot of examples around the state where those kinds of collaborations and coalitions are happening and, and I think they're making a difference. Medication assisted treatment without a doubt and the hub and spoke model is a model that is being looked at across the country. It is, it is making a difference. I, my understanding is it's reducing ER visits I think in 2017 by 89 percent. Uh, it's really making a difference in the lives of those individuals and yet at the same time we need to look at those social issues. We need to look at the social factors that impact 
this problem and this crisis that we're in and support families and support the individuals and support the children and, and, and really work collaboratively with our healthcare community, with law enforcement. I think it's, again, it's, it's, not, just, it's not just one organization, but it's all of us working together collaboratively. So um, that's all right. Thank you very much. Initial thoughts on it. Thank you. We'll, we'll get back to you later with specifics and okay. see, uh, some pointed questions. And Jill Lord. Thank you. I, I'm sitting here and thinking about the medical community. Um, I was a chief nursing officer at the time that the fifth vital sign came into to effect, and I was one of the ones carrying the banner of, I don't want people to be in pain. And that's where the medical community came from. We don't want people to be in, to, in any pain. We were trying to wipe out pain and not understanding what the addictive properties of these medications were. So as the doctors were working so hard to wipe out pain, they're now working hard to make sure that we use alternative sources for pain. And, uh, and I can tell you I have pages and I brought so I'd be prepared um, lots of pages of statistics, but I'll say statistics, statistics and you won't remember them. I just want to say we do have a problem. It's, you know, I, I again, I, I lead the blueprint for health for our region and, you know, I got a notice from the Vermont Department of Health saying, would you like to be part of this study group, this best practice for a whole, uh, you know, for a high burden opioid use uh, community? I said, we're not a high burden opioid use community. We, we have the lowest prescribing rate in the state for opioids, and we do. For the past two years, because our doctors have worked so hard, we have the lowest prescribing rate for opiates in the state. Wow. But, but, you know, that is great. That's hard work. And we've put things into a place. We've taken the best practices and we put them into a pace. And we have the second highest rate of overdose death in 2016. And mm -hmm. in 2017, we continue to have the second highest rate of overdose death from fentanyl and from heroin. Who are the people that we're not reaching? Okay? So it's not an easy answer. We can get the people that we, you know, that we're working with and we have people that we're not, and it's, and when I, when George says it's a community issue, it's a culture issue. Mm. You know, how do our children grow up and think about the culture of, it used to be, you know, having fun and drinking and, 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 and then it's escaping and the culture of despair. We have to build up our families. We have to work with our families and our, and, and as George said, with our communities to strengthen our families, strengthen our children so that we can actually at the root cause People heard of adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. and the effect on, pe on children's lives and, and th that effect on their vulnerability of being able to be exposed to you. So it's a, it's a cultural issue that we have to address as a community. So I bring things close to home. Um, so I'm proud of the fact that, that our doctors are not prescribing opiates and I'm proud of the fact that Mount Escutney two years ago started a um, chronic pain team. So we get together with doctors, a physiatrist, a massage therapist, an acupuncturist, um, people that in pain and addiction therapy, and, and we get together and we try and we sit with the doctors who have chronic um, long-term pain patients. How can we compassionately wean? What can we provide as alternatives? And that's part of the work that's happening in our community. I like to talk about close to home. Yes, we have a hub and spoke program. Mount Escutney hires um, spoke providers. The state of Vermont is brilliant and is ahead of the uh, head of the me. country. <laughs> no, I am looking at you because I, I am looking at you because you're a leader in that in that respect. I am, and I have to give credit where credit is due. And I think the state of Vermont is brilliant in adopting that model because we took Medicaid dollars and we put them into, for every 100 buprenorphine patients, we provide a nurse and a counselor to be able to do the kinds of things that George is talking about. So we can provide counseling and we can provide case management 
and we can provide education, and we can provide help. What's one of the chronic problems of a person that's, that's dealing with addiction? Dental care. Mm -hmm. You know, we can provide assistance with people getting dental care. Homes, mm -hmm. where are they living? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to address homelessness. These are some of the things that our providers are doing. Um, I'll talk a little bit else, because I like to talk about home. It's all about community. We have to raise our community and work together. Um, our pediatricians want to make a difference. So what did they do? They started a clinic for their moms of their pediatric patients who are addicted. And so we've had, for the past two years, a clinic for <clears throat> moms where we provide um, the Suboxone. We provide a play group, a therapeutic play group for the moms while the moms are in a therapeutic counseling group. And, you know, that's the leadership of our, our pediatricians and I'm, you know, just a, these kinds of things have to happen. We have to address this as a community. Um, we, we also started what's called ESPERT. Um, say it three times and it's yours. It stands for screening, brief intervention, and referral to, to therapy. Prevention, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to catch people early before they become addicted. We have a screening question that we ask, then we can link to HCRS has an, has an embedded um, clinician, a licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselor that, that they place at Mount Escutney and we can refer the patients to them before they're addicted, when they're at risk, those people that want to recognize it. But even talking about it, even raising the discussion, can help people be aware and can, can have a place on prevention. I want to talk about home. I want to talk about what's happening with our police departments. They've put drop boxes so that people can bring the medications in. And you know, where kiddos get the medications is in their parents, their grandparents, their neighbors and friends medicine cabinets and if I if you take anything away and I'm going to look at each of you in your eyes and say where are your medications you don't have to tell me but where are they are they in your medicine cabinet are they beside your bed are they in the kitchen if they are one of the things we teach people safe and proper handling of medications so kids aren't exposed and easily take them because that's where, if you look at the, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, that's where kids are, are, are getting their medications. They're getting them in the homes and in the communities yeah. in a big proportion. Um, so um, we do a lot of prevention. We work in the community with education, with our schools, with our police departments. We're pulling together a drug summit. We had one um, uh, uh, a month yeah. ago in June and we're having the second part now where we've brought together police, EMTs, mental health providers, Kate is there and, and will come representing HCRS, um, also um, recovery coaches and people struggling with addiction. And we, the last summit, what we did was we recognized what's the experience, what are we seeing in our county, keeping it close to home. And then next summit, next week, we'll be talking about, okay, what can we do about it? And so we're gonna form work groups, and our goal, that overdose rate, is not gonna be the same. All right, Joe, we're gonna have to cut you off there. Okay, so sorry, I know I get on a roll, okay, I'm yeah. sorry. All right. So we're gonna get into our question and answer period. I've, I've prepared a few questions for the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience after that. So the statistics are fairly mind-numbing, uh, if you look at them. Uh, and it, just in 2017, there were 69 highway deaths, uh, but there were 101 accidental deaths uh, from opioids. Um, so just looking at it by comparison, in, in Vermont, as it's been looked at as number one in, in terms of uh, opioid use by pregnant mothers, it's about number 20 in terms of the rate of death for opioids uh, by population. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how do you measure success in terms of identifying and assessing the problem? So the cost-benefit analysis of the hub and spoke system that's really recently been launched or that initial report was done, uh, determined that the Medicaid medically assisted treatment programs were successful but relied on some calculations of the benefit to society. And if you look at that, some of the numbers seem squirrely. 
Um, so how does Vermont compare to other states? What are the right things to look at in terms of our effectiveness? Is it, it can't just be death right, it can't be that you've thrown out a whole bunch of things, but if there were three things that you would say would adequately measure for being effective, what would they be? Oh, you only gave us three. Only three. Um, People can remember three really well. Mm -hmm. Mm. So one of uh, one of my uh, three would be the number of people that are taking medication assisted therapy. That's an evidence based practice, um, and uh, we need to measure how many. And we are measuring that, and we're tracking. Um, so I guess how many people are in are in treatment. Uh, receiving care and uh, the other I, I would we've set our own target and goal and challenge on um, on uh, tracking overdose deaths because that's something that's very personal for our community and we need to make sure that that's lowered and I think that's another measure I know you say you just can't measure deaths but uh, my con one of my concerns is who are the people that aren't in treatment we know the people that are we have people in our primary care providers but who isn't and I think that's one of our challenges is outreach and, uh, and outreach to people that aren't connected with the medical system. So um, that would be uh, the second one. And, and uh, I guess prescribing rates is the third one for me because we threw the Vermont, uh, um, the VPMS system, the Vermont Pro Prescription Monitoring System, we can get information about what is our opioid prescription rate, what, you know, what are we doing for, again, Benzos, diazepines, there's combination drugs that we want to avoid run for the hills from. So we need to not only keep track of what are, what are we prescribing for opiates, but what also are we prescribing for benzodiazepines and, and for um, stimulants. So I, I, I think we have to take a look at our, our prescribing rate. So I, I just jumped in. Those are, those mm -hmm. are the three that, that, that come to me. Okay, Secretary Gabay, would you add something? I would. So a uh, little story. I went to the, basically the Child Welfare Center in Washington, D.C. And I went there with a bunch of folks that are either secretaries or commissioners of Child Welfare or AHS from about 30 other states. And they put on an incredible tour. It's an amazing facility, incredible tour. They went through all their programs. And toward the end, I said, you know, you haven't talk about, talked about the opioid crisis. And the executive director, who's quite an amazing woman, said, uh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Vermont. And she said, that's interesting. We don't have one. And I said, what? And she said, we don't have one here. We have a meth issue. We have this issue. This We don't have, it's not the same here as it is for you. And it was really a, a moment for me where I was like, really? And so when you really look at, it's not that there, that there are not op an opioid crisis in cities or small cities. But it's worse in rural America and in cities that are kind of placed more in a rural way. And, and I could share all sorts of facts on this, but if, if you just go with me on this, my measure would be um, some composite measure of um, hope or loss of hope, despair, disconnectedness, mm -hmm. um, because that somebody may not be addicted yet to alcohol, they may not have a heroin issue, but they're going to. And we've got to understand that as Vermont and figure out how you tackle that head on and what that means to our communities. Because, you know, that's upstream, that's the prevention piece. So that's the number one thing if I could, I'm not saying it's easy to measure this, yes, but if you could measure that and do that by community, because we have these new community profiles we came out with at AHS, and if you haven't seen yours compared to the state or other places, you've got to check this out. The 60 measures of all sorts of stuff. If we could measure that and then really get at that and where in the community that is, I'm not saying we could and, or it's easy, but that would be my number one. The second thing I want to say is that, you know, everybody comes to AHS and says, prove that your things work, you know? And it's like, we spent two and a half billion dollars on all sorts of stuff. And you, it's like, prove it works. And it's, like, it's really hard to do that with social services. Okay, some of the proof is just that we're humans and we need to have some humanity, you know? And so 
some of the proof is that we're just good people taking care of good people. And so that to me is a, a part of this. But in this case, if you take the MAT population and you look at their health expenditures, if you add medically assisted treatment costs, which are large, to the health care costs in the population that's in MAT, mm -hmm. and compare that to the population of people that show a sign of opioid dependence, dependence they're spending less money in total being in MAT than not being in MAT. And we went over this with the federal government, and they're this close to giving us a Medicare waiver to treat opioids, which means we'd be the first uh, st state in the country to draw down federal money for it. We're like, I mean, we're literally just a little bit away from negotiating this, and so don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> but the reason is Nobody because we've shown them the math, and they want in on it. California is doing the hub and spoke across California. It's only a little bit bigger than Vermont, and so it's going to take them some time. But, but the math is there in this one realm. In, in a lot of AHS programs, you know, we try to show exactly what some stuff does. Some of it, it's really just hard to say, but, you know, we know it's, it's right to do some of the things we do. This we have the math on. So medically assisted treatment is the gold standard. It, 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 it is evidence-based but it's also a better intervention than not doing it from a dollar and cents standpoint in health dollars. I would ab absolutely agree. I think the cost offset of health care costs, I mean, there's no question that, uh, I mean, of course, we'd have to actually look at the numbers, but I, I do believe that we, we see that that is, those numbers are, are pretty impressive. But I would add to that that I think those cost offset are not just in the world of health care, but looking at the cost offset throughout our, the state of Vermont, throughout our communities, for instance, whether it's measured in, in prisons, because when someone hits, and we have the Sparrow Project, which we had from, I think it was 2009 till 2017, which was a pre-sentencing program uh, for people that had substance abuse related crimes, and it gave them an alternative. And it made a difference. The Jefferson Center, through, the Jeffers Center through UVM did an evaluation and found that recidivism, recidivism or reoffense rates went way down, and people were staying out of jail. They were going back to the community. So if we could impact those numbers, and with the the DUI treatment docket that we have, we've just received a SAMHSA grant to expand our DUI treatment docket, which does something very similar and provides case management supports for those individuals. That's gonna keep, so when someone goes to jail, it's gonna be, it's five to 10, it's 10 to 20, it's, it's not a week, it's not two weeks, it's not six months, it's for an extended period of time. When you add on to that, that many of the folks that we serve, many of the, the people that we're talking about have co-occurring, co-existing mental health issues. So if they need to be hospitalized, that's going to be, that's another $1,500, $1,600 a day. Mm -hmm. Now, they may need that, but on the other hand, if we can provide services that keep them out of those hospitals, that is a great savings. So I think the cost offset throughout the system, as well as healthcare, are, are huge, and I think we need to look at that. But ultimately, I absolutely love what you said in terms of that measure of belongingness or connection or whatever you might want to call it up. I seem to remember in Europe there, 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 there's a lot of work in that regard perhaps. I'm not can't quite sure where, I'm not sure where in, in Northern Europe, but and I think in the UK, I think they even hired a minister of loneliness or, or something like that, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they wow. came up with. Uh, I think it might be, I don't know if it's related to Brexit, but in any event, <laughs> uh, but loneliness and social isolation, what's that? They're going to be lonelier because of this. Yeah, that's, but that's very true. But, uh, but social isolation is a public health issue as well. And I think that and despair and all of that sort of factors into, uh, into all of these people. But having said that, uh, I, think there are, I think the measures of looking at those cost offset and really, really doing an analysis, uh, it's there, but ultimately, it really is, it's, it is going back to what, what you said, that human cost is so critical because the question is who are we as a society? What, what is the statement that we're making in terms of our values and what we believe in? And I think really being able to make a strong statement that these people, these are not 
others. These are, this is us. This is all of us. We are all, it is a continuum. This impacts each and every one of us. I think we all, as you said and others, you know, it is, everyone has a story. I mean, I have my own personal experiences that I can draw from, and I understand that this crosses all socioeconomic lines, yeah. although certainly poverty and not having the opportunities to access resources without a doubt impacts the ability for someone, I think, it, people's ability to access, you know, to, to get the help they need. And yet, I do believe that this is something that has crosses all well, lines. So that's a, that's a great yeah, point yeah. and a great segue because uh, we talk about it being a cro cutting across all socioeconomic uh, groups. And you, we look at the treatment, and much of the treatment is paid for by Medicaid. I think in some cases, 88% or 68%. And uh, then we also talk about the, the hopelessness that you're talking about. And, um, we don't have to think too hard to find a parent who has a child that's been addicted and they don't understand why. And it doesn't, uh, and even if they come to accept that the child is addicted, the question is, are they addicted forever? Um, and that's what we're talking about is a chronic disease. Is this something that someone can will themselves to overcome once they're addicted to opioids? And some things I've read said, absolutely not this person is going to be on treatment for the rest of their lives. Um, is that true? Uh, is, is it possible for people to kick their addiction to opiates uh, or opioids? Um, and how do we address that? Want me to go first? Sure. You know sure. So, yeah. So the interesting thing about substance use disorder specifically addiction to heroin or, or opium or opiates or opioids, is that if you, if you read The Realm of the Hungry Ghost, uh, Matei gets to the point where he, basically the point is made, you know, it takes three things basically to, to, to be addicted. It doesn't just take oxy. I mean, hmm. you know, and, and the, the point is made when you look at the Vietnam War, people were addicted in Vietnam, came home, and, and were not addicted, did not, did not use heroin again. And so it's something that we don't fully understand. And there's a great uh, video out or TED talk called Rat Park, if you've ever heard of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son actually told me to watch it. And this was probably six years ago. R -A -P -P. R-A-P-P, rat, rat as rat. in, oh, rat. rat as in like, you know, the thing you don't want to see in the subway. <laughs> um, and the whole idea was that, was that they put and, and humans are not rats, but this, you know, science kind of works this way. They put rats in a cage, and they didn't give them any fun. They didn't put, you know, uh, rats to play with or anything to do. And they put uh, opiate water and regular water, and the rats that had nothing to do drank the opioid water and died. And then they created Habit Trail Rat Park, where there was a lot of um, beautiful young women rats and a lot of great-looking young uh, male rats and they had rat park where they could have all the fun they ever wanted to have and they never drank the opioid water. And so it's not what you think it is necessarily. It's not just the fact that you take oxy. It's, there's other th components of addiction that lead to it. It's that, you know, it's, it's, the, it's why I think that measure would be so important. You know, if, you're, if you feel like you have no hope and you are isolated and you are not connected and you take opioids and you know just it's just a condition that's ripe and then then we have where we are now and so that's the problem with this because some people will say hey will is a muscle it must be exercised you know how many people here have been on a diet <laughs> you know, you, well why what's the problem you just you just do it well it's a, we, humans don't work that way it's not that simple and so this is such a complicated conversation about how long is somebody actually still addicted. Some people, you know, I was up at BART in St. Albans, and we talked to uh, some folks where a guy had come there for three years, every single day, and received treatment. Even when he went from methadone to, to suboxone, 
He went there every single day. They then said, well, you gotta go to a doctor in the community. You can't keep coming here. He said, no, this is what I do. I come here every day, 6.30 in the morning. This, this is, I come here. He got off of Suboxone. He came there every day and touched the building mm -hmm. and went back and got in his car. Habits. Mm -hmm. He could not not do that yeah. and stay sober. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is, you know, it, it, the point I'm trying to make is this is a human thing. It has to be treated in a human way. We can't think that it's a weakness of, of the will or of the soul or anything like that. It is not, and it is way more complicated than any one person can fully understand. Medically assisted treatment is the gold standard, but there are other treatment modalities. I mean, there's other ways to treat this, and some people, you know, do it for a short time and, and move on. Others, it's for a very long time. It's, there's no, you know, it's that, that age old thing, if you've seen one, you've seen one. You know, that's sort of the way this works. Because what everybody says is, so, so you've been spending all this money, is everybody better? And it's like, yes, they didn't, they didn't overdose and die. And can we leave it at that? You know? And so let, we got to be careful how we, how we push this, you know? It is delicate, there's no doubt. Absolutely. So we have time now to go to our questions, unless you want Can to address I, that. Sorry, you know, yes, I, before we go into questions. I love there. that story. That is a great story. I also, but I also, you know, I, it's, you know, I was taking notes, or right? I was doing these notes, and I'm not, I haven't looked at it. But one quote I just want to share, which was actually from The Hungry Ghost, and I just want to share the quote, and actually I got it from the Opioid Coordination Council. It was right on the chair. In front, and you're <laughs> it's right there. So... But I just, I just have to say that it's so, it, to me it's so powerful. Uh, not every story has a happy ending, mm. but the discoveries of science, the teachings of the heart, and the revelations of the soul all assure us that no human being is ever, is ever beyond redemption. The possibility of renewal exists so long as life exists. How to support that possibility in others and in ourselves is the ultimate question. And it's the human question. It's the, com it's the question of our humanity touching someone else's humanity, remembering that, that we are in this together. And it is complicated, but that we can do it. If we work together, we can do it because it touches all of us. And so I think it's, so I, I just absolutely love this quote. And, I, and he's amazing, uh, if anyone's ever, uh, Gaur Mate is a, he's done some yeah. good trainings in the state. Realm of so. the Hungry Ghost. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Hungry Ghost. Yeah. So, do you want to add you. something to that uh, last <clears throat> question before we open it up to the audience? Not really. I I I, I would agree with uh, both what um, what has been said, uh, and I and I think that we have to learn to. I just would emphasize from a medical perspective, this is a chronic disease. Nobody chooses to live, um, you know, in an addicted state. We, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a will um, mm -hmm. issue. And, and think about the twelve-step programs and why they're powerful. And it's because of the, a part of it has been the framework and the connection, um, the human connection. And I think that that is. Um, one of the things that we remember with this, with the opiate crisis, is too. It's it, um, not everyone is in a 12-step program, but it's it's relationships that make a difference mm -hmm. for people to mm -hmm. be able to. And so, part of what we have to to think about. Oh, so you started me off. Um, <laughs> is is um, is stigma, and I do yes. have to say it sometime mm -hmm. uh, tonight. Is the stigma that people have to bear related to that chronic disease. And I think we have to fight that and open our eyes mm -hmm. around the words that we use, the language that we use, yeah. and, yes. and how we treat people that have addiction. And so we got a, I think we've got a lot of work in building that culture that you're talking about of hope. Mm -hmm. We have to address the issue of stigma. <clears throat> Very good. And so before we open it up, just, uh, just some ground rules. Uh, since, since we sat down, we've had some, uh, some elected politicians come in, whether well, three senators from Windsor County, Senator Dick McCormick, Senator, Senator Allison Clarkson, and Senator Alice Nitka. And we have some legislative hopefuls uh, in the room as well. Um, Jack Williams. Jack Williams. Is a candidate also for Windsor County Senate. Did I miss anybody? Yes, Randy Gray. And Randy Gray. Yes, yeah, sorry, Randy. 
um, also. So it's uh, an interesting group. Uh, we have a select board member from the town of Woodstock as well. So there's some elected, uh, Mary Riley. So we have and some elected trustees. Oh, an elected trustee. Yes, so uh, everybody has a, a, has a <laughs> position. Um, so um, just for, for questions, uh, you can address it to the entire panel. You can address it to a single member of the panel if you'd like. Just please be succinct. Uh, and the questions, so there's ample opportunity for the panelists to answer them, because it's already, it's 10 of 8, and hopefully we'll be done by 8.30. Sound, sound fair enough? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, please introduce yourself when you ask the question, and then, then right. go ahead. Can I use the uh, wireless mic, please? Oh, yes. Oh, the mic, it's I can got a power that. switch on it, too. I hear you. <laughs> so introduce yourself, and then Yes. Hi, um, my name is Dr. Diana Berger, and I'm, I'm just inspired by everyone's stories tonight. Thank you so much, and I've learned so much. Um, I'm uh, boarded in preventive medicine and public health and think about epidemics. As you all touched on, this is a severe, devastating, social, political, environmental epidemic that hits everyone, rich, poor, living, wherever, under, the street on in tents under in Rutland and all over. I, I treated over a hundred patients with MAT up in Rutland. Severe up there. It's severe all over. I'm originally from New York City. The epidemic is severe there. The epicenter is in the Bronx and Staten Island. Staten Island, if you've ever been to that island, it's similar demographically. Uh, to more, looks like more like Vermont, although it might be three or four times bigger than the whole state. Anyway, um, I just did, just want to echo the, um, you know, I think of several things. The strongest social determinant of health and illness is poverty. And with poverty, you have despair, you have just, you have stress, you have homelessness, you have hopelessness. So, and part of this MAT, the medically assisted treatment, in my opinion, um, the, the psychosocial piece, the LADCs, the counselors, the social workers do more work than the Suboxone. Suboxone is effective. I want to leave everyone knowing that buprenorphine, which is the fancy name for Suboxone, <coughs> uh, cuts mortality by 50%. Um, there's no other drug out there. Blood pressure medicine, diabetes medicines, cancer medicine, asthma, anything. Buprenorphine, it's called bup on the street, um, is very effective. So. In terms of getting more people into treatment, there were only 2% of doctors across the country who were wavered by the government to even prescribe this medicine. It's nothing fancy. It's a very simple medicine. Doctor, it's, do do you have a question for our panel? Ah, <laughs> my question, there is no question. It is so complex. None of you um, who are experts in the field, expert, expert, listening, you are experts. Jill, I know, has been a nurse for 40 years. My new friend over here, 60 years of us as a nurse. There's no answer to it. It's maybe we can touch on a few things. Um, I guess my question for a political person um, is, uh, is Vermont putting enough attention to prevention. That is key. And it's hard to measure, but it's real important. Prevention of overdose with Narcan, Naloxone, mm -hmm. and prevention starting at five years old. The kids need to know, stay away from heroin. It could kill you. Okay, thank you. So that's the question. All right, that that's have. a question. Thank you. Is Vermont <laughs> I can doing go enough? on and on like Jill. <laughs> is Vermont doing enough to prevent on prevention? So you mentioned the four pillars. We have prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. Right. So are, is it a four-legged stool that has equal weight on each leg, or is there more weight on one of the legs or any of the other legs? 
Uh, that's an interesting way to ask that. I'd have to really think about that. My, my quick answer to prevention is no. Um, we're, not, we're not doing all we can because some things we can, I mean, not everything you do takes money. Let me say that. So it's not like, gee, we got, you know, the only solution is money. There, but we're not doing everything we can. Just one example would be, you know, at, on the Opioid Coordination Council, we have folks from uh, the education world. You know, how many of you had health class when you went to high school? Is almost everybody? No. Almost everybody? I don't remember. So, that <laughs> in the classroom, is it eighty percent of the people? I guess it's there's yeah. an age divide. <laughs> <laughs> so I had it. I mean, but so you're young. And, no, no, I'm. I've got some gray going here. So, but my, my point, my point is that, my point is that, health class didn't morph into something better. It went away, and so that's not a good thing. I had health in eighth grade. I had health in tenth grade. It was incredibly embarrassing and painful, but I've relied on it my whole life because it taught you all sorts of stuff that when you're in tenth grade you didn't want to learn next to the boys and girls that you knew. Um, but that was also part of the learning. We don't really do that anymore. And if you're being told we do that, then you're being told the wrong thing. We, I'm not saying they don't ever have a little minor, minor conversation. But they don't have health class. And that may not be true in Woodstock or in one other school or three schools. But across the state, it's not the way it used to be. Hmm. And that's a big miss. And um, obviously, education spending is a big issue. Um, people would say, oh, gee, we've now got to spend all this money. Um, I don't know how they did it when I was a kid, but it, I learned a lot from it. And so that's just one example of prevention that I don't think we're doing that we could be doing. Um, and I'm not saying you've got to run out and hire a bunch of teachers to go do it. I, you know, our gym teacher taught it. You know, I mean, it, so um, by the way, they don't have gym anymore either. So. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, well, I, I have to say, I did, uh, I did have a sort of a health class. Uh, I, I grew up, I was in the Bronx, actually, I started in the Bronx, moved to Queens. But we, it, was, it was extracurricular. It was like after school, but it was not in class. Uh, and, uh, but I, I have to say, education, because it is about primary prevention, it's about education. When, Jill, you, you talked about stigma, I'd, I'd like to add to that, because I have, uh, I am reminded that when I say when we say stigma, we also have to consider discrimination yes. because that they go hand in hand, and that is an issue, and that is a challenge in terms of opportunities. But I do think uh, we don't. There is a lot that is happening in the community. In Bellows Falls, we had something called Importance of Hope. There was a a big community forum. We had over 200 people there. It was a great effort to educate around the crisis. We had family members, we had a lot, it was a really great event. Uh, in Springfield, recently, actually last week, we had another event. Uh, I think there it was called the importance of help, uh, community helping each other. Uh, so there's a lot of community events and it is, it doesn't always take money. It's, it's to change the culture. You can't buy a new culture. It is, it's gonna take education, it's gonna take compassion, it's going to take understanding, it's going to take building it into the educational system and really looking at prevention, but the payback is not going to be in a year or two, as you said, it's not an election cycle, it's going to be five years, it's going to be ten years, that's where we may see that change. There's also, I know, efforts, and I, I would like to sort of point, if I could, uh, we uh, just received a grant uh, in the Wyndham County area around coordinating some uh, some efforts, and I don't know, if, Kate, if you could yeah, speak it's a, briefly uh, to that. Yeah, Grant. For He's going to tell you to get oh, the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, Kate Lamphere, I am uh, first and foremost a family member of many, many people who have um, been afflicted by opiate addiction, and including one loved one whose life was saved by Narcan and is now a year in recovery, um, just to give some hope. Uh, but I'm the uh, Adult Services Director at HCRS working with George, and we recently uh, pulled together a consortium in Wyndham County, because Wyndham County, I think, is number one? No? High. We're high in, in opiate deaths. 
So we pulled together a consortium and we applied for a HRSA grant and we were awarded the grant yesterday. And it's uh, $200,000 to do planning around rural opioid response. And, and what you were saying about the rural problem, that's the, we have treatment. People can get into treatment. People can get into treatment immediately if they can get there. And that's the yes. thing that we see most, most often is that, that people just simply can't get there, particularly in our region in, in Springfield, where there's, there's, there's nobody, there's no prescribing. And so people have to go to Bellows Falls or come up to Windsor. Which um, town? Which town? It's Springfield. There's oh, just, Springfield. there's very little, very little in Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. In the month. I, I, I just need to, I just need to point out that there's, there's a solution in the room and the solution has a name and her name is uh, Geraldine Fowler. Uh, uh, there's people like Geraldine <laughs> that are doing things with our children and with our families that are astounding. And that's part of the, st the solution of joining as, as coalitions of people that are doing asset development. And that's what Geraldine is doing in the Woods Woodstock area. She's a great asset. And I think more people working together in that respect. I think we, Vermont as a state has had a long history of prevention and the Vermont Department of Health has been a leader I think in the nation. We've had prevention coalitions for a long time. We've been, I, we started in Mount Escutney, it was the early 1990s where we had a prevention coalition and we've been working on education with the schools mm -hmm. and with the police for, for the drop boxes and so on since then. But I, I just want to highlight the work that Geraldine and other really brave and honorable people are doing to provide an environment for kids where they do have hope and, and adults that care about them and provide positive activities that are skill building and, and supportive. Geraldine, you got a shout out. Do you want to say something before you pass the mic over to Leon who had a question and then also to the Senator? No, no. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Um, I just, I think what really sticks out to me is the, what I've written here, things like connections, um, human connection, education, relationships, um, discrimination, and, you know, these are the things that, that touch us and touch us at the, at the North Chapel UU. Strengthening families, you mentioned, which is the framework that I use when working with um, families and something I really hope to promote in our community. Um, but. So thank you, thank you for doing this. And, yeah. So, so if I could just make a quick comment about, so um, if there's access issues, mm -hmm. transportation is really complicated and really expensive. Let's talk to Tim Ford at Springfield and see what he can do to get people doing stuff in Springfield. It's so much easier than me building an entire transportation network, mm -hmm. which we do. Yep but it's hard work and then it falls apart and then we don't have it and then people can't get treatment and this isn't something they can miss and we should just... We just started that conversation great, last week. Great, <laughs> Anything I can do to help you, let we me know. We will pull you in, yep. thank you. So we're saying go local, don't well, wait for the state to do it or don't try to build something so large that it has a structure that can't be maintained. Well, it's just the most complicated thing in the world is try to build, trying to build um, uh, si systems that deal in random so transportation for people we don't know we can't connect with all it's really hard if you got some docs prescribing bupe you know and, and doing and doing the um, met, uh, the treatment part you don't have you don't have to have the transportation as much so it just it, it's just a lot better way to do it doesn't mean we don't need transportation assets we have a lot of it we do a lot of it but it, it, it it's never easy um, and the minute there's a problem, people are missing treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. So we're going to go to uh, Leon. Uh, uh, my name is... A question, I'm oh, so sorry, quick question uh, about access and transportation. Um, my practice is... Doctor, um, we've, uh, we've moved on, if we can. Oh, uh, well, so let me just ask a quick question. We can, we can, come, back. Yeah. We can come back here. My name is Leon Dunkley. I'm the minister at the North, Chapel, North Universal Chapel Society. I'm honored to work with Geraldine. Um, um, I was just wondering if, uh, I had sort of three ideas, I was wondering if you, if there are any models, like integrative models that will deal with things like transportation, education, prevention, what, you know, what is, and that can also sort of inform the public conversation about opioid use, um, I'd be interested in, in, in working with that. Um, 
Also, are there vulnerable ages? Are, are we sort of more vulnerable at different times in our life to this kinds of thing? I'm, I'm new to the understanding, but I'm wondering if a, a, if a program that unfolds in a high school would be uh, useful, um, kind of responding to what you were saying about health. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I would say is, is, is there any sort of corporate level response from Big Pharma who kind of got the ball rolling? So anybody want to tackle? Uh, so we have three questions, really. Is there an integrated model uh, between education, treatment, and transportation? I think well, all, and look, all the different All aspects. in one in dealing with it. The second is, uh, are there vulnerable ages uh, that makes more sense to focus on that vulnerable age to address the issue? And the other one, what is the corporate response? So the, so the corporate response has been awful. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, it's just sort of fascinating. Um, you, you can track this, you know, with one graph. Yeah. You know, it's basically, and there's one letter that was sent out that said that oxy is not addicting. Yeah. And right at the same time, the fifth vital sign and prescribing in America went from here to here. Right. And then addiction followed like a week later. And so we can see that, and you would think that you know folks would be saying, "Man, we got to work on this and help people and all that." That's not the response that's happened, and I think that's terrible. But th that's that. So as far as like integrated models, all of them are local. But what they do is they come to to AHS, and it's typically a a, a phenomenal human being like this, or a phenomenal human being like that, or a phenomenal human being like that, or a phenomenal human being like that that gets together and says, we got to get the hospital together, together with the community mental health agency, together with other folks in the community, together with um, the schools or um, uh, religious entities or what have you that have built models throughout the state where, you know, there's some transportation, there's some childcare even for people while they're doing treatment. Um, so there's a whole bunch that um, we could describe and, um, and, and help you with. I think in this area, from talking with my folks, there's a lot of work that could be done in, in you know, building some of these things. You mentioned Springfield. We could use that as a test case of how we bring together transportation, prescribing, tr uh, treatment. You know, that's all really good stuff. You know, I, I think about the Brattleboro Retreat. You know, they're, they're a hub, and they now have childcare. We have transportation there. It's all sorts of stuff going on there that wasn't there. Uh, five years ago, and so it can it can happen, and we're part of it, and we can we can work with you, and and there's incredibly talented people at the agency of human services that care more than you would ever imagine, um, you know. So I, when I say that, a lot of people think, oh, state employees, what are they really like? You just cannot imagine who these people are and how much they care. And uh, Jill, to that point, the right. group that you convened in June, right, that you're reconvening mm -hmm. next week, right really is that consortium of people it, from all different agencies and right. police and, and yeah we work we work in the in the uh, model of partnership and and we have for a long time we've had a uh, community collaborative um, the Windsor area community partnership since the early 1990s and that is bringing school and human services and citizens together to jointly tackle these issues i think you know we've started with the prevention model we do have that community collaborative. We have doctors that prescribe. We're working with the hub and spoke. So I think in a local area, we can be, um, I, you know, we're really doing a lot to be, to integrate those kinds of services. And it works because we're able to have trusted partners like Kate working with Kate in HCRS, like Geraldine working and doing the things that she's doing. And we can leverage each other. And we can support each other because it can't be done by just one person. It has to be people working together. That's and so uh, the other thing I'd point to, um, the AHS uh, is, uh, has started in our area a uh, integrated services program. George mm -hmm. and I are both part of first both Springfield and Hartford area, bringing agencies together so that we pool resources and talent and we, and we work together on the issue you know, making exponentially the response, um, you know, more effective. Well, as, and as George said earlier, it's not them, this is us. This is That's the community. Right. So if someone uh, in a capacity such as Leon, who leads a, a religious organization, 
wants to do something, what should they do? I mean, what's the first step that someone should take to say, I want to help because I know there's pain and I'm not sure what to do? He's already doing it, so I, I just have to recognize that. Yes, Geraldine <laughs> is his agent of change, but y you know, he is, he's set the leadership, so he is already doing it. And I think it's looking at a local coalition. Most of these, most of throughout the state, there are coalitions of agencies working together. You can go to your hospital and find out what is the prevention coalition that's, that's working together, and you can join, and they will have open arms. Mm -hmm. Because okay. there's not enough of us, you know. There's always more that can be done. Terrific, yeah. Senator. Could you pass? Uh, yes, right. Thank you. Vulnerable ages. Right. That was the one question we just. Is there a one vulnerable age that is more? So there's so there's more vulnerable ranges. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Okay. Everyone's vulnerable. So, um, so my belief is you, that this is about getting the kids, you know, prepubescent, pubescent explaining to them what's going on in the world and, and talking to them about uh, connections and things like that. ACEs was mentioned. You know, there's, a, there's a great movie out called Resiliency. Um, highly recommend you watch it. You could watch it with your team and then you could all talk about it. But basically the prescription for um, folks that go through really tough times in their childhood, have high ACEs scores, um, is uh, to um, have one adult in their life that's not paid, key not paid, that cares about them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I will tell you that I have quite a few ACEs scores in my life. You know, my, my person was a football coach. You know, that, that's what sort of got me to stop being an absolute idiot. Well, partially, but, um, <laughs> but, but I mean it. And, you know, I, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know what was happening. And then I watched that movie and I was like, that's exactly what, you know, that saved me. So, you know, that's something if we understand is happening at, at a young age, um, we, you can get out in front of some of these things. So basically, you know, it's a, it's a 20s thing and an and a, and a early 30s thing primarily you know, from what the research says. That doesn't mean that it's limited to that and by any stretch, but that's the bulk. But I see this as a, as a ACEs issue and, a, and a, something that has to be hit head on in the youth that we have. So, thank you, Senator. Um, earlier on, uh, my friend Jill, you mentioned the fewer prescriptions right. and that it was presented as a good thing mm. because Presumably, there'll be less addiction. But these opioids are, first of all, painkillers. And they're not just bad things. They're bad to the extent that they're addictive and destructive. But they're also good things in that they relieve pain. I look at it being like fire. It's a good thing unless it gets out of control. Right. What are we doing for pain? Mm. If we're not using the, uh, the, the, the painkiller, because whatever else is bad about them, they were pretty effective. Right. So what are, we, what are we using instead? So we're still, we're still prescribing um, opiates for acute pain, but what we're doing is we've set limits. We've said, you know, if you're going to be taking this medication over a certain period of time, you have to actually have a contract. You have to understand. I have to provide education to you about what the effects of this are. And I, people are not prescribing for certain conditions that they used to liberally prescribe for. So they're, being, they're using discretion around that. They're limiting the amount of time that people can use them. And we have to change our mindset. The other thing is, is we did go from a period of time where we wanted you to be pain free. And now we have to teach you, you're gonna have some pain. And people have to learn that, that the goal is not being pain-free, that the goal is function. And so we're going to help you get full recovery and function, and there's going to be, you know, and we're going to have to work with you on that. There's compassion that has to be worked with it, and it's not, you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? I mean, there, you have to use opiates for the right condition, for the right amount of time, and you have to do the right education and put the limits around it so people understand that you know the goal is not pain-free. The goal is recovery, rehabilitation, healing, 
and, and we're going to help you get there together as a team. Does that, I don't know if that helps. Well, so let me give you a couple of examples that, you know, I think will hit home. So, uh, when I had my wisdom teeth out, they, they had them out late in life. They gave me, you know, basically a, you know, a flower pail <laughs> full of uh, hydrocodone to go home and take, you know, <laughs> for the pain. When my last child had his wisdom teeth out, they told him how to take Tylenol and Advil in a rota on a rotating schedule so, so that he would not be in more pain. They gave him one pill when he was in the chair that he took when he went to leave that was stronger, you know, hydrocodone. But then he went home and he never had hydrocodone for his wisdom teeth. Mm -hmm. It never entered his mind that those were the things he should use. So that's one example, and that's the, what, the, the, what the dental folks have been doing. It's really important work. Second is, if, if you talk to... Um, you know, a whole giant group of doctors, they'll tell you it's the second prescription mm. that's the issue. Mm. So if you have something bad happen, like say your shoulder gets hurt, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> if, you, uh, you, um, if you break a bone or something and they give you pills because you're in a lot of pain right away, you take those pills for a few days, it's the second prescription that they have to really be thoughtful about. And so doctors have been changing the way they think about that as to, to, at that point, do you go to Advil and Tylenol or Aleve or whatever on a rotational basis? Can you manage your pain that way? And so um, that's what's going on here. If you look at the amount of prescriptions in 1999 and where they went to by 2011, it's like this. They've come down, but they've only come down to here. They're not down to here yet. You know, so we're not even back to 1999 prescribing levels. So. You know, the, the House and the Senate did great work with the prescribing bill. I don't think it would have happened if you hadn't have done that work. I, I want to say that, so great job. But it's not back down to where it was. And so all this work, is we're still prescribing way more than we used to. So It, it, it gets simplified on television. It's like, well, the max that you can have is seven pills. It's not that simple. Well, no, if you have, um, you know, there are bone cancers that you're going to be in pain for the rest of your life yep. and you may be on um, you know some form of opioids for the rest of your life but then how you how you hide those pills from your grandkids how you you know there's you know it, it's not that you want to deny um, pain relief medication to people that really need it right. it's that you don't want to give it to people that don't need it and the people that have it you don't want them to lose it to somebody who's either stealing it or borrowing it, or what have you. Right. So it's a, it's a it's a complicated conversation. Quick, quick follow up. Oh, if you must. If I thank, I'll, I'll just <laughs> who has the last word on how much pain the patient should have to endure? Mm -hmm. So does that there's so there's a whole set of guidelines published in 2017. It took effect then, right, based on the legislation. So does yeah. it actually say in there who has the final call? Is it the doctor? The, it, you know, it, it, we always, we have to listen. We have to use knowledge and education. It's a, it's a discussion between the doctor and the patient, and there are guidelines we have to follow. Right now what's happening too is, uh, is uh, insurance companies are saying, we're not gonna pay for it. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't, uh, we're not gonna, you can't prescribe it. Mm -hmm. Or you have to, you know, so it's a dialogue. And I don't know if there's a last word. I think it's a dialogue, but we, we have to change the dialogue a little bit so that people understand, you know, what are the options and alternatives. Are there other questions? Senator Ditka. So I had a question with regard to- You need the microphone, though. Oh. Thank you, Barbara. With regard to the council and the issue of, you know, fentanyl and so many people dying of it being mixed with all kinds of things now, um, what are you doing with regard to the future, potentially looking at safe injection sites? Yeah, so uh, safe injection sites, uh, uh, what we call SIFs, which are safe injection facilities. The problem in this whole conversation is there's all sorts of different terms for the same thing. So we just did a paper on whether or not Vermont should do anything about safe injection facilities. And we came to the conclusion that we should not um, and I want to explain why. First, they're illegal. And, you know, you know, it's 65 miles an hour on the highway. Everyone doesn't drive 65. So what does illegal mean? When the 
folks from the federal government tell you that they will prosecute you immediately if you do this, that means they're not going to they're not going to let you drive one mile an hour over 65, and you can't do these because they're illegal. That said, medically assisted treatment was illegal at one time, and so things evolve, and we know that. But right now, our recommendation is, with our limited resources, that we don't pursue that because it is strongly and that's a weird thing to say illegal. Um, the second um, point I would make about it is that um, there's not a lot of evidence that it actually um, accomplishes what you think it would accomplish. Um, where they have these, for example, in Vancouver, which is where Gabor Mate um, works and where he wrote his book, Realm of the Hungry Ghost, about, it's very, very urban. And um, people get come there by walking and then walk home. And in a rural setting like Vermont, People in Burlington are like, oh, we could do it in Burlington. And it's like, well, okay, but I'm from the state of Vermont. And so how do you do that, you know, in Springfield? Or how do you do that, you know, in Barrie? And how would people get there and then get home safely? And so you put the combination of we can't prove its efficacy together with, oh, it's really illegal. And our point is with our limited resources, let's stay away from that for now. If the legality changes and everybody's sort of pushing on that, so it might, or we begin to see some evidence that it might work in an area similar to Vermont, hmm. we, we're going to keep an open mind. But at this point, we're not going to push it. With the money that we do have, we want to invest in what we call safe recovery, which sounds like safe injection, but it's basically um, where you can get needles. The term needle exchange, we're trying, trying to retire because there's no exchange. Hmm. Um, so we want to do more with syringe programs, with case management, with syringe, with Narcan, um, and with possibly trying to get you into treatment because you've come in for these supplies. Also, you make a great point, Alice, about fentanyl. We want to actually get strips out so people can test what they're using to see if it's in it. Um, we're doing that at Safe Recovery in Burlington. There's money um, in the plan that I'm going to bring to the Joint Fiscal Committee next week. Again, don't tell anyone to do all these things, and, uh, and hopefully we'll all agree on it and, and we'll get moving. So we're going to focus on syringe uh, programs and not safe injection facilities for now. The other thing, and I would just say it because it's one of the solutions we're going to talk about at, at um, our meeting next week, is there are some legislative um, solutions that um, we could think about, and that is intent to distribute um, laws. I mean, our, our chief of police has been talking about that for a number of years, and I think talking to our law enforcement partners about decreasing access for distribution of, of medications because if we can decrease access that's another way of prevention so I, you know I would I would turn to our colleagues and partners in the in the enforcement agencies about that okay. another question yes yeah. uh, Bob, the microphone. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you uh Phil Blackburn uh, out of Brattleboro here with two hats on volunteer hats one's with George and Katie's organization and uh, I'm also privileged to be president of the board for Natural Alliance Mental Illness for Vermont, and thank you for your agency support. Um, and the uh, the word that comes to my mind is awareness. You know, in mental illness and addiction are often co-occurring, and I know that folks who, you know, our our biggest challenge in NAMI here in Vermont and before I moved here two years ago in, uh, in Houston, where I was a volunteer for years, was people didn't know about us until a crisis. And even when crisis came, um, they still didn't know about us. Perhaps there was stigma involved, but uh, before you can really be stigmatized, <coughs> you have to even be aware <laughs> of services, if you will. So uh, I guess the comment I would throw out is uh, just your observations on awareness of some of the services that you're offering some of the preventive measures that, that you mentioned just you know help us you know just bring awareness to the general community about services be they addiction services or mental illness services because um, whether you believe it's 30 percent or 60 percent the number's large in terms of co-occurrence if that makes sense yeah makes a lot of sense you, you know so i'd say we're really bad at that you know, if you, um, if you have a child who has uh, a serious uh, 
uh, case of depression or is possibly suicidal or is addicted to prescription medications or you know has some other we, we say these things travel together you have one of those issues and you're trying to deal with it it's very hard to know where to go and that's true everywhere in the state and, and that's that's something we need to work on I think it's a great point I'll also say that people that are already engaged in the system you know they it's amazing once you embrace the system how quickly you learn the system you know so it's you know the tipping point from not knowing and being lost is really quick to once you're once you're a part of it and you really learn you learn what's out there um, what I worry about is that there's people who really need help and can't get to that tipping point um, and I've had I mean just because I have this position I have people come up to me all the time and say you know I'm at Hannaford and they're like Do you have a minute and I, you know I, it used to be about the Patriots or the Red Sox or something and now and I'm being I say this in a very tough way now it's about my kid, you know, my wife, and, and it's like, what do I do? And I'm like, give me your cell phone number. I'm going to call you when I get out of here. Let me talk to you where you can not whisper and feel like you don't want to tell me. It happens all the time. And it probably happens to all of you with what you do. Um, it's amazing. So we could do better with that. Yeah, just so you know, <laughs> big city or rural environment, Vermont, the awareness is, a, you know, it's the same issue. Okay. Thank you. George has a thought? Uh, yeah, thought related to that is it, well, at, at our agency, at HCRS, I mean, we've integrated our adult outpatient mental health, the program for folks with a serious, more of a serious mental illness and uh, substance abuse. And so all those services are now integrated. And so there's, uh, and we're providing recovery groups and, you know, a whole range of groups from, you know, individual therapy and group therapy and motivational interviewing and a whole range of others but part of the other piece is that our services are co-located and connected in the community because it's going to where people are at it's, uh, we have for instance I mean we have a, a KDAC a, a drug and alcohol counselor at the drop-in center uh, at the shelter uh, in Brattleboro at Upper Valley Haven we have someone who's connected there who are co-occurring trained we have staff that are connected and co-located and we go, you know, at reach up, at probation, parole, voc rehab, uh, in community centers, at Mount Escutney, Springfield Medical Care, and pediatric. I mean, it goes on. You know, it's certainly broad, and yet it's, it's, you know, it, it's just it's just one piece. But we're certainly, you know, by embedding and going to where people are, are and going on the street, and the police social work staff. We have. Right police social work liaisons from Brattleboro all the way up to Hartford plus the Vermont State Police now at Rockingham Barracks and they deal with many issues related to substance abuse and I mean, they're particularly I, I don't know if it's more in Brattleboro than other areas but uh, we see a lot of it there and so that's a real challenge but can I just I say it's really also the um, one really important thing we've done is mental health first aid and it really is getting the word out and it's available to anybody we've gone to libraries and done it with library staff and shelter staff and it's really a, an awareness building stigma busting training that we offer free of charge to anybody in the community it's not for providers it's for people anybody and we've you know we started doing this a few years ago and we do you know 15 to 20 trainings a year for everybody everybody just says why didn't I know about this? And that's where we talk about the services and stigma and you know discrimination. And so get the word out. We that's that's the way. Great. I think we'll leave the last question before closing remarks to Senator Clarkson. Oh, thanks. Well, I, I have a big question, and it's not going to be answered in the two minutes we have. But uh, you've repeatedly ad addressed one of the biggest drivers is poverty. And so every you know everything we're doing is so interrelated. Um, we talked last night at our forum in Bridgewater about affordable, uh, you know, raising the minimum wage. I addressed it. It's all of these pieces. How do we, I mean, do you have a, I'd love to work, we, we have to address poverty in this state big time. And uh, until we do that successfully, we're really, you know, that's one of the root causes here. It's one of our exacerbating challenges with ACEs too. So I, I, I'd like us to actually go back to that and, and 
I don't know if you have quick thoughts for us on how we can address that, or, uh, but, but I think we're all committed to trying to address that. It's a, it, it affects so much uh, from education to public health. Mm -hmm. So, in two minutes, solve poverty. <laughs> <laughs> that conversation can continue. Uh, you and I will keep talking. Yeah, you're so, so, uh, so, my take on it would be, as an employer and as a, as a state uh, employee working on these big issues, is that, um, it, you know, it's amazing to me um, in my restaurant work, because if you're a restaurant owner, you are um, literally a social worker, because that's what, that's your workforce. And if you think it's not, come work with me. Um, and it's amazing to me what keeps people where they are. You know, it's like, you know, what makes somebody stay where they are? You know, is it education? Is it their family? Is it opportunity? Is it their hourly rate? Is it their lack of health insurance? What is it? And so no one has ever found the code, and somebody's gonna jump up and say, I have, but no one's ever found the code to holistically move that, move that needle. You know, it's, it's, a, it's amazing to me that I can't get a plumber to come, an electrician to come, getting sheetrock done, or anything you wanna do around a restaurant right now is virtually impossible, because there just is too much work for too few people. There's so many jobs open. And so how do we have people that are still not working? or still working below where they see themselves wanting to be, or not having the trades they need. You know, I mean, th that's the thing that I think about, is how do you get people to go from where they are to where they want to be and stay there? And, you know, that's, a, that's the puzzle that, has, um, that we have failed, you know, humankind on for thousands of years. But that's the thing we have to deal with. I don't think it's minimum wage. But it might be a little bit. I don't but think it's just health care. I think, but I think it's all of it. It's my point. It, 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 Can I just say too? I mean, one of the things that we're going to have to do and think about as employers is thinking about people that have felonies, people that have been through this and have had their lives affected because of the addiction. That we're going to have to think a little bit a different way about giving them opportunities to provide them jobs, and it, housing is affected for uh, for these folks too. Um, as well, and I think we have to open our eyes to that. Yeah. We, Marcella Wilson, we went to uh, uh, a program. We're really trying to <coughs> adopt these principles in our in our communities, fi providing financial literacy so that people understand how to do yeah. budgets. And, so true. And and I mean, so true. So we have a church in uh, again I'm talking about the, uh, Trinity um, Evangelical Church. They provided a. A financial literacy program last year that was astounding and they did it with a peer-to-peer -peer. you had a helper that stu mm -hmm. stood with you 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 mm -hmm. you had somebody that was your advocate and went through the course with you and then that person stayed with you afterwards if you had questions and so on it was awesome so financial literacy opening up uh, Beth uh, Demers is running this program Swiffy where um, it through the Vermont um, Technical College where they're providing education and they're providing wraparound services and support for manufacturing jobs and and uh, and trying to you know so people are doing some creative things i think we have to do more with economic um, development we have we need people but we got to have some services around to provide support for people so they can be successful in the jobs with some case right. management and some supportive services but i you know it's something it's we all need to work on Absolutely. And I, I think that's a really, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because workforce development, it's not just the people we serve because needless to say, I mean, that gives meaning and purpose. There's no question it's critical and yet it's also workforce development for the programs. We can't, we have openings for staff. We, we, we might have gotten a HRSA grant or a SAMHSA grant, but then we have, to, then the challenge is we have to hire for it. And that becomes, that is really, that is, that is a big challenge. Uh, so I think that is a big, that is a big, that's a big one. And economic development, attracting people to Vermont, this is, a, a, Vermont is an amazing place to be and to live and to work. And yet, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, and so I think it's, it, that's definitely something that I think could help, help us turn the curve on you know the issue around poverty and uh, so 
Well, your next week's forum will be on economic development. Which we're going to sit at seven, but we yeah. are, right in here. You we are going to conclude because we're at our witching hour of eight thirty. And would you be available to speak with folks afterwards? Absolutely, uh, that would be great. You could do one more question. Well, right I think I, I. Well, we're we said eight thirty. If it's if you're really brief, Jack. Okay. <laughs> Very brief. Um, Where's the women here? Three word answers required. Okay. Did you turn Every, it Everything we've talked about tonight is, is really marvelous, everything that they're doing, but it's all prevention after the fact, you know, after people are addicted. Um, I really look at it, you know, like Mr. Secretary brought out, you know, once you're addicted on, on these drugs, you know, we've recognized that, you know, people get addicted to it and, and it's hard to get them off of it. And, Prevention before we get on drugs, that's the key. Right. Mm -hmm. And like Mr. Secretary said, you know, all of us had health classes. That is probably one of the best things we ever had in school. Now my question, I don't want it to be controversial, but how does legalization of marijuana help in preventing drugs? I, I think it's just a gateway to drugs. I think it's one of the worst things we've, we've done in this state, legalization, because instead of preventing it, we're just adding another uh, way of getting on it. Yes, so do you want me to take that quickly? Yeah, if you can, it's, you've asked a question which could take you know, a couple hours. Uh, well, no, but, no, so, no, but to be respectful to the question, it is yeah. a two-hour question. Your question is mm -hmm. a week long, and that's, a, you know, that's an amazing Absolutely. question. But so my answer to that would be, that, you know, I'm a former military officer, went to military school, you know, ran my restaurant company, you know, I may have strong personal opinions on it. But here's the fact, pot is everywhere. So you, whether you legalize it or whether you make it decriminalized or you make it wildly illegal, so we're locking everybody up who has it, it's everywhere. And so it's not a question of how do we prohibit it from existing in our state. That's not the question on the table. It's here. It's, it's ubiquitous. And so the question is, now that it's here, how do we prepare people to be able to encounter it, do it, not do it, deal with it in their life, but not fall into the trap of poverty? You know, that's the question for me. Not, you know, there's no way you'll ever get me to say that it should be, it should be anything um, more than decriminalized, meaning that you, that you shouldn't go to jail for having a bag of pot. That was ridiculous because it just isn't, that's just not the right way. So decriminalized was a great move by Vermont. Where we go from there is a big debate. You know, my, my personal opinion is we ended up in a bad spot because we're sort of somewhere in the middle between like me and David Zuckerman, <laughs> you know? And at some point people are gonna have to choose, am I right or is David Zuckerman right? And maybe Vermont will pick David Zuckerman's yeah, lieutenant yeah, governor. Yeah. And, and he's a big proponent for, for tax and regulated marijuana. Right now we have what I call sort of legal, because I don't even understand it and, you know, what we do now. We used to just be decriminalized. But, but what that does is it blurs the whole conversation around it's here and how do we deal with it? Because I have serious concerns for young men and boys right. that smoke pot and its impact on their brain chemistry and their initiative and their ability to socialize. Yes, because the brain doesn't mature to a certain point. We have got to be preventing through education that from happening um, because as a restaurant owner with a whole bunch of young men that have worked for me over the last 25 years, if they're smoking pot eight times a day, there's a whole bunch of other issues than what you would think or you would know. So we've got to hit this head on, it, it, whether we tax and regulate have what we have now or decriminalize it, it is here. We've got to put the money into prevention and we're not. And, and so and that just adds more to what you guys well, it, are working with. And it, it's starting in like fourth and fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade. Yeah, if you saw the numbers that came out on E SIGs today, that's a whole nother thing we gotta hit head on. Yeah. Because that is really concerning. So uh, vaping, vaping. Oh, oh, vaping and I don't know the right words because I'm moving into the old. I was never cool, but now I'm just old. You know, so. I thought you said E6. E6. Sorry.
<laughs> so with that, that um, thank you. And that, that might be a topic for another discussion. That's the third Thursday. The third Thursday, yeah. <laughs> 7 yeah. o'clock. Welcome to be here. Uh, but would you like to add anything as a closing remark to our discussion tonight before we part? Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for coming. Thank you I mean, for organizing yeah, this. It was yeah. well, well, this room event. is full of people that are servants to other people. And so thank you for what you do for other people Absolutely. because not everybody gets out of bed every day in the morning and says, I want to be an elected official or I want to have a ministry or whatever it is. You're, you know, everybody's helping people in this room. So thank you for everything that you do because, you know, again, we need to be more human to the humans. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Gabay, Jill Lord, George Karabakakis. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful. Yes. Hey, great job.